Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Voodoo Garden. My name is Ray. I will be your host today. And, uh, oh, there went a white fly. <laughs> Gosh, Ray, could your garden pests just come out anymore, right? When there was no white flies until I turned on the camera. And then there's a white fly just going, I don't know where it's going because there's nothing over there but a clock. And, um, anyway, all of these questions come from Facebook friends and I have a lot of them. So I'm going to use their first name and I'm going to run off the question and give the best answer I can. I have not researched any of these yet, so I may not be able to answer them all. Let's get started, shall we? Connie is number one. Hi, Connie. Uh, Connie, um, is it realistic to have chickens in a small backyard in a small town? Um, it is realistic, but check with your local ordinances because a lot of towns do not allow livestock and chickens are allowed livestock, even though you may consider them pets. Ooh, a white fly just flew across the camera. I don't know if you can see it. I don't know why they do this, but uh, anyway, Connie, uh, check with your uh, local town ordinances and stuff to make sure it's okay. And uh, if you don't have a neighborhood uh, organization that uh, prohibits it, it is actually very fun to just have a couple chickens. It's wonderful. It is therapeutic. They are fun to watch. They are entertaining and you get fresh eggs, which you cannot get at the grocery store. You can't get them like you can get them right from your own chickens. So yeah, I think it's a great thing. I have chickens and uh, I totally enjoy them and I thoroughly have a great time out there. So yes, check. Okay. Um, Missy, Missy says, uh, what is your favorite direct out of the garden washed off with a water hose treat? That's an easy one. Tomatoes. Tomatoes? Oh, okay. Well, maybe strawberries. Tomatoes and strawberries. And you know what? I don't even wash them off. I know that sounds kind of creepy to some people. I'll be walking out in the garden and it's a nice sunny day, nice ripe tomato. I just pluck it right off the vine as long as there's no bugs or anything like that. Pop it right into my mouth. And let me tell you something. You can eat a lot of good foods and you can uh, prepare tomatoes any way you want. But let me tell you something. When it's a warm sunny day and you're walking out in your garden and you pop a a warm tomato into your mouth, a little cherry tomato or something, and you eat it, that is the best tasting tomato you're ever gonna have. And also the same with strawberries. A lot of people like cold strawberries. I like them right off the vine. They may be warm in the sun, but still, the, the strawberry flavor is just amazing. Those two are my absolute favorites out of the garden. Okay, Ken, how beneficial is mycorrhiza in the garden? Well, first of all, mycorrhiza is not a product. Mycorrhiza is a process where, um, certain types of fungi uh, work with plants in a beneficial symbiotic relationship. For instance, the fungus attaches itself to the roots of the plant. And these are these like little tendril funguses. And the funguses eat. Uh, they take the carbohydrates out of the root of the plant. Sounds kind of sucky, doesn't it? But in return, they return minerals to the plant. It's kind of like uh, giving the plant more roots. So it actually helps the plant. So it's a symbiotic relationship. Uh, generally, this type of fungi is available in a lot of natural soils. You don't have to add it. Plus, if you have fertile soil, whereas you use fertilizer or compost, you don't need it because your roots are getting plenty of nutrients the way that they are. In poor soils, this will work. You can buy it and add it to your soil. But it's so much easier just to make compost or make compost tea and pour it into your garden. But a lot of people like this product, so I don't uh, badmouth it. It's a great product, but I just don't use it. I don't see a need for it. Next question. Chad, um, is there a certain size of tomato plant? No, wait a minute. I'm sorry. Is there a certain size of tomato plant should be before transplanting outside? No. Answer to that is no. You can transplant a tomato plant anytime after it gets its first true leaves and uh, you want to harden them off first. I'll go into that later because I noticed somebody else had a question about that. But no, there is absolutely no particular size that a plant has to be before it's transplanted out into the garden. Next! Boy, look at me go. Uh, Etienne. It, it, uh, it's spelled E-T-I-E-N-N-E. -N -N -E. um, I'm sorry. I, I butcher everybody's language and I'm really sorry for butchering yours. I know it's French. Etienne. Et Etchen. Etchen? Is it etchen? Okay, whatever it is. I hear a lot of people telling me not to use chicken manure in the garden and a lot of people telling me the opposite. What do you think about that? Um, yes, there are a lot of people that say do not use manure in garden, especially chicken manure because it could have salmonella, it could get you sick, blah, blah, blah. And there are a lot of people like me who say absolutely go ahead and use it. It is absolutely a choice and I won't say one way or the other which you should do according to statistics or health. 
I use chicken manure compost in my garden all the time, and I've been doing this for decades and never ever had a problem. I've never been sick, never got poisoned, nobody's ever gotten poisoned out of my garden. And it's a perfectly natural product. I mean, animals poop on the ground all the time and plants grow out of it. Um, I don't see a problem. So my point of view is absolutely, if you have chicken manure and it's composted, toss that in your garden and you're going to have wonderful results. I use chicken manure compost and I have the most amazing results in my garden. So yes, absolutely do that. Okay, next one, Michelle, look at me go, I'm just like, Michelle, um, what is the, you need to move. Um, Michelle asks, what is the best food amount and time frame to give for the most plants? Um, I, I uh, absolutely promote compost tea. Compost tea is, in, in my opinion, the perfect food to give to your plants. You just take a heaping handful of compost and you put it into a five gallon bucket, add water, stir it around, let it set possibly overnight and the compost will settle to the bottom. You take the liquid, water your plants. You can water them once every third watering for a general maintenance, but if your plant is looking like crap outside, use it every time in place of water. It is impossible to use too much compost tea. And the wonderful thing about it is if you have crappy soil and you can't afford compost, you can't afford, uh, or you don't wanna have chickens and make your own compost, compost tea can be made out of bag compost and you can use it every single time you water and it will not overdose your plants. Unlike other fertilizers where you can use too much, compost tea is wonderful stuff. Look at me going, I'm just talking like crazy. But I have a lot of questions to get to. So yes, compost tea is the best thing I could possibly recommend using for your garden plants, no matter what kind of plant it is. Next one, James. Hi, James. Uh, what are your thoughts on diatomaceous earth. My thoughts are it's fantastic stuff. Diatomaceous earth is nothing more than these little microscopic sea creatures from millions of years ago that died in the ocean or wherever the heck they died. And uh, they uh, formed this crust and it's like this white chalky powder and it's all broken up. People use this to kill slugs and other kinds of insects, chewing insects on plants. You dust it on it, it's like flour. What it is is it's microscopic, sharp, razor sharp pieces that uh, if a slug travels over it, it slices and dices them up and they do not like this. And if a chewing bug eats it, it, it literally rips up their guts from the inside out. Yes, it's not very pleasant. Um, I, I think it's a great idea. I've never had the need to use it, but if I ever did, I wouldn't be afraid to use it. But this is just me. I wouldn't use it on a plants where I'm going to eat the leaves like lettuce. Uh, if I did, I would rinse off the lettuce extremely well because even though it may not hurt my digestive system, I don't like the idea of all of these microscopic shards going through my ancient uh, digestive system. So it's a wonderful thing to use. Um, Matt. Hi, Matt. Uh, is it true that you have to manure chicken manure before use? I don't know what, <laughs> I copied and pasted this. I don't know what you're talking about. Um, if you mean compost it, if that's what you mean, yes. You cannot use raw chicken manure right out of the bird. It is called hot. And what hot means is not temperature hot. It means acidic type of hot, uh, chemicalized hot. It will literally kill your plants by burning the roots. It's just way too potent, way too strong. Composting breaks it down to a, a nutrient base that your plants can actually use. So yes, definitely compost. Uh, chicken manure if you have. Okay, next one is from Jude. Hi Jude. And uh, Jude asks, is there anything specific I do for squirrels digging or eating in my garden? Um, aside from my uh, crazy neighborhood cats, which are legion, and walking through my yard day and night, um, no. Uh, the one thing that I would recommend that I actually do, actually, is, I said actually twice, uh, is feed your squirrels. I know that sounds ridiculous. Okay, garden over here feeder over here on the other side of your yard, exact opposite, as far as away as you can get it from your, your uh, garden. Put a feeder over there, throw in some cracked corn, uh, whatever you think that squirrels will like to eat, throw it over there. Squirrels are gonna migrate over there where the food is, and if you're trying to keep them out of your yard, you know, you're chasing them out, squirrels aren't stupid. They may seem stupid, but they're not. They're gonna go for the easy food, and that's what they do. They are not out to give you all kinds of crap. They want easy food. And what they do like is nuts and corn and wheat and things like that. So I throw cracked corn in a bird feeder, keeps my squirrels over there, keeps my plants alive and healthy over there. Uh, that's my best advice. Other people may have better advice, but that's what I say. Uh, next, Michelle. Hi, Michelle. Uh, will you ever consider writing an ebook with your pruning and gardening tips? Uh, <laughs> uh, no, uh, I'm not going to write a book and I'm never going to have a site where I put all of my tips and tricks and stuff like that. What I like to do, and even though I think that that might be a good idea, um, I like to interact. 
with my viewers and friends. And I think that videos and Facebook and comment sections are a perfect place. I'm an interactive gardener. I don't like to just throw out information and have you take it and I'm inaccessible where I would be in a book. So on my Facebook, on my comment section, as large as my channel is getting, I still take the time to answer each and every question as best as I can. It takes a lot of time, but this is exactly what I want. I want to have an interaction here because with a book, you can't, you know, you may not find an answer in that book. Whereas if you can get a hold of me, you may think, ah, oh, I can get a hold of Ray on Facebook. I could just post a comment. It may take a few hours or a day, but he will get back to me. That's why I don't write a book or do any kind of published information from myself. It's just how I prefer to do my gardening. Okay, next. Um, Jake, <laughs> I, I remember this when I was printing it out. Where does the dirt go in a root bound potter plant? That is like one of those weird things. And uh, I, I have no idea. I have no idea. When I read that question, I actually had to stop and I'm like, hmm, I have had root bound plants. And you know, you put a, you put a seed in a pot, you grow the plant, there's all this dirt in there, your plant grows up huge and eventually you have to transplant it because you can see roots like coming out and stuff. You pull it out and there's nothing but this ball of, of roots. And you're like, well, I know the dirt didn't fall out. I know my cat didn't eat it. Where did the dirt go? Did it go into a burger in Boise? I have no idea. If anybody knows where this dirt goes, uh, feel free to post your answer. That's kind of like, what is the one, uh, the sound of one hand clapping? You know, I have no answer for that, Jake. I'm really sorry, but really good question. Okay. Next one, Jason. I have a huge pile of leaves and I've been turning it over and adding coffee grounds to it, but it doesn't heat up. Uh, besides using a tarp, what can I do to help my compost cook? First of all, do not put a tarp over it. Um, uh, you, uh, Compost does not cook because you heat it up. And that's a misconception a lot of people have. Not your fault. Compost heats up because of bacterial action. Heating up does not decompose compost. Bacteria and fungi, uh, they decompose compost. Heat is a side effect. Yes, it's a side effect. And it's not absolutely necessary to breaking down your compost. So putting over a tarp may heat up your compost, but what that does is it may kill the bacteria that's in there because it gets too hot. So what you want to do is you want to add more greens. My advice is mow your lawn or if somebody else is mowing their lawn, maybe they have bagged grass, load it up in a trash bag, throw it in there. Let me tell you something, green grass from a freshly mowed lawn, that is the fastest thing that is going to kick your compost into high temperatures. I had a grass compost pile once and holy smokes. Yeah, it gets really hot. So fresh green grass or more coffee grounds. Keep it moist, slightly moist, but not too wet and pile it as tall as you can, not wide, tall. That's your best bet for getting it cooking. Okay. Uh, La Kevion. <laughs> That's a cool name. La Kevion. Is it okay to fertilize plants after they set fruit? Um, I like to fertilize all the way up until it sets fruit. And then once it sets fruit, I do a maintenance program and I use compost tea outside. So uh, what I'll do is I'll give it compost tea to help it grow. And then once it sets fruit, I slow it down to maybe once every third watering, once every fourth watering. I just watch the plant. If it seems like it's needing something, give it a little compost tea or whatever fertilizer you're using. Whatever you're doing for your plant, as a ballpark figure, cut it in fourths once it sets fruit. Because once it sets fruit, you do not want to boost the nitrogen. You don't want to boost the growth. You want to let it set its energy into ripening that fruit. Okay. So no, I wouldn't recommend giving it too much fertilizer at all. Okay. Next, Danny, could you possibly touch on a cool, on cool weather crops? Yes. For Northern uh, climate people, radishes, lettuce, spinach, uh, beets, definitely beets. They're cool uh, weather crops, uh, carrots. You can plant cool weather. A lot of those things, you can plant the seeds outside as soon as the ground thaws. It does not have to be warm and above freezing temperatures. You plant the seeds right after the ground thaws out and it's close to being the last frost. Plant them down and uh, by the time they sprout and come up, the weather's generally warm enough. But radishes, any kind of cold crops like cabbage, uh, uh, kale, anything that's like a cauliflower, broccoli, they love cold weather and they actually thrive in it. So uh, plant any of those. Uh, carrots can stand cold weather easily and they grow extremely well in it. Um, keep away from corn. Corn needs hot weather in order to germinate. It will germinate in cold weather, but it really screws. Next one, Judy. Would it help to use tea on the bed before planting? I'm assuming you mean compost tea. Absolutely. Compost tea is good anytime. I know I say it over and over and over like a broken record. Uh, compost tea 
is impossible to overstress. It is the best thing to give your plants other than compost in the soil. So compost tea, yes, you can pour it on your garden anytime, even in fall, winter, anytime. It doesn't go bad in the soil. It feeds the soil, which feeds the plants. And so compost tea is your best thing to put in the garden anytime, before, during, and after you plant your stuff. Next one, Carrie. Hi, Carrie. Um, would you suggest I not include, what would you suggest I do not include in my compost tea? Cooked foods. I know uh, you could probably add cooked foods, but if you're asking for my advice, no cooked foods, no meat, no grease, none of that stuff. Some people say you can do that, but as a rule, I don't throw in meats, cheeses, dairy, uh, cooked foods of any kind, even if it's vegetables. I prefer not to do that. I feed it to my chickens, uh, but I don't add any kind of cooked foods. Um, that's about it. That's as far as, as far as I know, uh, I, I'm sure there's other things, but right off the top of my head, doing my speed weekend edition, that's the first thing that comes into my mind. Uh, next one, um, Era Lee, is raising chickens cost effective? No. Raising chickens, uh, well, if you live on a farm, it may be if you let them free range because they get all their food free. If you live in town like I do, a small town and you have them caged, uh, you can move the cage, you know, if it's one of those portable chicken tractors, all over your yard. That may be cost effective. Where I live, I don't have one of those because I have way too many birds and I have long winters. So I have to supplement their food with cracked corn, scraps, things like that during the winter. And uh, if it gets too cold, I have to keep them warm. And uh, eggs are so cheap at the store. So they're absolutely not cost effective. But, but the balance of that is you get fresh eggs and there is nothing that compares to a freshly laid hen egg. The, the store-bought ones, they feed the chickens just barely enough to get an egg. They balance off cost ratio per egg, whereas we don't. And so uh, farm fresh eggs, if you ever taste one of those and then you taste a store-bought, it's like eating cotton when you eat the store-bought one. So yes, they are cost effective in the way that you get good quality food, you get entertainment, it's just fun and you get the compost. But as far as uh, cost-wise for the eggs, no, absolutely not. So you gotta consider the entertainment value and also the fresh food value. Okay. Luke from the My Gardener channel, have you ever foraged in the woods for compost? <laughs> I thought this question was hilarious because he did a video on getting compost out of the woods and he really got tore up by some of his viewers and I understand some of their points of view. I lived on 80 acres. I had woods. I owned that property. I absolutely went out there and I raked up some leaves and some of the uh, soil out of there and uh, a couple of the rotted pieces of wood I crumbled up and I did it exactly like he did. But on the flip side of that, uh, well, on that side of it, yes, I've done that. It worked wonders in my garden. And also I raked out some leaves from right on the edge of the, gar uh, the forest by my driveway. Yeah, I raked them up into bags and took them into my garden and it worked wonders for my garden. But on the other side, if you don't have a large area of woods, you might wanna just take a very limited amount or consider making your own compost because um, if a lot of people did this, it would actually deplete the soil off at the top of the forest. And that's exactly what the forest needs. It is not something that you can just, you know, take all out of the woods and then leave nothing because the woods need this. And so do the creatures and all the other uh, organisms that live in the soil there. So yeah, a little bit, I would say yes. That's my personal opinion. Hope nobody gets on my case for that, but yes. Yeah, I think it's a great thing. Next one, April. Hi, April. Uh, how do I figure out how to feed my garden plants without raising, lowering pH levels? Easy peasy. Compost. Uh, a lot of fertilizers will make your soil acidic, make it too salty, make it alkaline. You know, it's a hard balance when you're using artificial fertilizers and uh, mixing soils and stuff like that. One thing that is a universal, constant, universal medium in gardening is compost. If you can buy compost, make compost, Add that to your garden. It feeds your plants perfectly because it feeds the soil, which actually grows uh, microorganisms that will break everything down and make the food available to your plants. And that is the perfect way to go. It, it, if you have acidic soil, slightly acidic soil, it balances it more toward the alkaline side. If it's alkaline soil, it brings it down a little bit more to the acidic side. So a compost is a great balancer, great feeder, the most perfect thing you can put into your garden and that is my advice on that. Next one, Woo, look at us go. I know, I'm going crazy, aren't I? Um, George, hi George. George says, um, I have a lot of leaves in the woods around my property. How best to compost them? We have the ideal ratio, uh, what is the ideal ratio of green to brown materials to take uh, to the pile? Okay, yes, you can take leaves and you can compost them, but the best way to do it is to line them up on the ground and go over them with a the mower. Break them up, chop them up, because leaves take a long time to decompose. But 
If you mow them, it breaks them up into little broken pieces, gives them more surface area. And the more surface area you have, the faster things will break down. And that is a great deal. So uh, as far as the perfect ratio, everybody has their own ideal and there are scientific facts. What I like to do is I like to add approximately I don't know, equal parts green and brown. I know a lot of people don't do that, but that's my way, okay? I use a lot of nitrogen in my compost pile. The more greens you use, and not necessarily the color green, greens are considered nitrogen sources like coffee grounds, uh, manure, mowed grass. Those are considered greens because they're nitrogen sources. Browns are the carbons, which are the leaves, the paper, stuff like that. I like to add a lot of nitrogen because nitrogen is the fuel that ignites the compost pile and cooks it. If you add too much greens, they say it stinks and it, you know, it does all this nasty stuff. That's actually you just revving up your compost pile. And I did 30 day compost by adding a lot of manure and greens into my compost pile. I got that sucker to break down in 30 days. That's a record for me. And that is amazing. And that wasn't just, you know, uh, easy to break down stuff. That was straw, leaves, all that garbage. 30 days, I had perfect compost. So half and half will get you a fast compost. If you had less greens, slower compost. All right, next one. This is a combined question from Stefan or Steven and Christina. They both ask uh, pretty much the same question. So I put them both together. Would you talk about hardening off plants? How many hours and days should we harden tomatoes and peppers before putting them outside? And does everything grown indoors have to be hardened? First of all, yes, everything grown indoors has to be hardened off. Hardening off means acclimating to another environment. That's all it means. Your plants. I have super bright lights in here. It's like bright as the sun, but if you go outside and you look into my grow room from outside, if I had windows, it's actually dim in here compared to outside. The brightest grow room is not even as bright as a shady day outside, uh, out in the clouds. So you got to consider that when you take your plants out, it's a shock to them. I recommend taking your plants, putting them in a shaded spot for a few days. Each day, take them out there, put them in a shaded spot, bring them back in. Do that for a few days and then work it out into maybe an hour's worth of sun for a couple days. And then after that, a few hours worth of sun for a few days. After a week, your plant will be all ready to go. Put it out there and it'll be just fine. If you put it out too soon, your leaves will get kind of whitish around the edges or, you know, kind of fade it out. That's just sun scald and that means your plants weren't ready. Okay. I hope that answers your Okay, next one, Michael. Hi, Michael. I would really like you to talk about the many different types of pepper plant problems. <laughs> I can't do that. That is one question I can't answer. Michael, that is too broad of a question. There are infinite amounts of problems that you can have with your pepper plants. If you ask a, a particular question, I could try to answer it as best as I can, but I really can't answer uh, su such a broad question. Uh, that's just, uh, I don't have time for that, and it's just way too broad for me. I'm really sorry. Okay, next one is from Rose. Is it expensive to own a couple of chickens? What type of health problems do they have? Would they be happy without a husband? Oh, I get it, without a rooster. Are there such things as quiet hens so the neighbors don't know I have them? Hens are quieter than roosters. Roosters are the noise makers, no, uh, roosters are the troublemakers. If you do not want baby chicks, you do not need a rooster. Hens will lay eggs without a rooster. Some people don't know that and I don't fault them for not knowing that because not everybody knows everything about chickens. Chickens will lay eggs without a rooster. You only need a rooster if you want those eggs to hatch. But uh, roosters, not necessary. A couple hens is fine. The thing is, hens are relatively quiet. And, uh, but when they lay an egg, sometimes they lose their mind. You think about it, you know, that's, that's a big egg coming out of a tiny chicken. They don't like it. It hurts. So every now and then they lose their mind and they start squawking. If you're not allowed to have chickens or if your neighbors are going to be bugged by you, you may want to think twice about that. Um, that's my advice on that. Okay. Esther. Esther has a cute question. My husband won't let me have chickens and we have an empty dog pen, completely fenced, sides and top. Would that make a great coop? Yes, it would, but you're also going to need a, a, a covered area, an enclosed area, if you have cold temperatures or rain, because you don't want to just have them in a, in a thing with a top. You want to have kind of like a, a box with a hole in it to where they can actually go in and hide at night. Chickens like to roost at night or be in an enclosed area at night. Um, I want just four hens. He thinks it will smell. Should I t trade my husband for the chickens? <laughs> oh, I um, <laughs> can't answer that. 
<laughs> um, uh, chickens do have a smell to them because they, they make manure, but I don't mind the smell because as uh, you know, I got used to it. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, that's compost for me. So as far uh, for me, it doesn't bother me. For some people it may, but it's not a smell that carries out into your neighbor's yard. So it's not really a stinky endeavor. And with four chickens, now, as long as you rake it up and put the manure uh, somewhere else, like compost it and use it in your garden, it's not stinky at all. Um, I don't know, sweet talk your husband. And uh, come on, it's your house too. If you want chickens, get chickens. Make a deal with them, okay? Um, uh, you get chickens and he's going to enjoy fresh eggs. Or um, just tell him that's the way it's going to be, okay? <laughs> I'm sure he's going to listen to you. I, I had a mom and a dad. And let me tell you something. My dad was the boss, but when my mom wanted something, my dad listened. And uh, that's just how it is. Okay, next one. Charles, why do my plants love coffee as much as I do? Well, it's because uh, coffee does have nutrients in it. Mic uh, micro amounts of nutrients. The coffee that we drink, yes. And uh, coffee grounds are very high in nitrogen. And so my guess is the liquid coffee has a little bit of nitrogen in it as well. And so every now and then, if you have acid-loving plants, uh, pouring a little bit of coffee in your plants, they're going to love it. So uh, coffee is good for your plants as long as you don't use too awful much of it. Um, next one, Scarlet. Hi, Scarlet. Um, a garlic head I brought from the supermarket started to sprout. I put it in a container with water. Now it has roots and leaves. Should I put it into soil? Um, if you're growing a bulb of garlic or an onion, it will grow roots and it will grow greens, but it's surviving off the energy in the bulb. That's what they're designed to do. When you plant them, they take that energy out of the bulb. They shoot up the leaves and shoot down roots and they exhaust the energy from the bulb. Your plant cannot survive on water alone. There's not enough nutrition in there. Eventually it will use up the energy in that bulb and it will slowly start to die. Put it into soil and it will start to put those roots down, take nutrition out of there, and then start forming even better greens and eventually it may put out a bulb. You never know. Next one, Robert. Hey Robert. How do you make chicken manure from owning chickens? You compost it. That's what you do. Wait a minute. He said, how do you make manure? Um, <laughs> okay, that was odd. Um, I don't know. You feed them and they poop. But if you're talking about compost, you just mix it with, with uh, straw or leaves, pile it up, it breaks down, and you have compost. Next one, Lyle. Hey, Lyle. Can I, don't worry, folks. I'm almost done. Um, Lyle says, can, I, uh, can steeped compost tea be used in container plants? How about self-watering containers? If so, if so, how much and how often? Huh, I need a break. Um, Lyle, uh, you can use compost tea in container plants. I don't use compost tea indoors because the compost I make outdoors has little micro bugs and stuff like that, and I don't want that inside because outside there are natural predators for those bugs. Indoors there are none, so I don't want to be bringing those inside. These are way too valuable to lose, but for outdoor plants, Absolutely. You can use it in any kind of plant, any kind of garden, any kind of watering system, even self-watering. As far as how often, I use compost tea once every third watering for maintenance, or if your plant is really looking crappy, use it every time instead of water. And yes, you can use it in self-watering containers. Barking Mad. I love that name. Barking Mad's been a friend of mine for a long time. Uh, he asks, what kind of soil mix do you use for your fruit seedlings? Um, I use, uh, for my fruit seedlings indoors, I use half cocoa peat, which is called coir, half uh, potting soil. Currently, it's miracle Grow Moisture Control. Uh, usually, it's generic, but I found a sale on miracle Grow. I mix them half and half, put a big old heap and helping of vermiculite in it, mix it up, and that is my uh, potting soil. Extremely well-drained, not very nutritious, but I use a mild organic fertilizer to water my plants, and they do absolutely fine. But that is the perfect soil for indoor plants because the, the cocoa peat allows it to hold moisture, but not too much. The vermiculite is great for draining, and of course, the potting soil is potting soil. <laughs> it works for me. Next one, Chris. Do coffee grounds act as a green or brown material in the compost pile? First of all, greens and browns in compost. Greens are not necessarily green. Browns are not necessarily brown. Greens are a nitrogen source. Brown are a carbon source. That's all you need to know. Carbon, nitrogen. Um, coffee grounds act as a green, a nitrogen source. They are very high in nitrogen. So if you want to, if you have like crushed leaves or anything like shredded paper and you want to compost those and you don't have any greens, go to your local coffee shop or save up coffee grounds like I do in a trash can all winter long. Throw those into the uh, compost pile, mix them all up, filters and all, and it will heat up like that. And it will make some fantastic compost. And even though coffee is acidic, the coffee grounds are not acidic because the acidity in coffee grounds is water-soluble. It goes into your coffee. Yes, you're drinking all that acidity. 
Coffee grounds are non acidic and they will make perfect compost. Okay, next, Eva. Hi, Eva. What do you think about. Oh, hold on. Breathe. Okay, <laughs> let's try that again. Eva asks, what do you think about using chickens in your garden to keep pests down and to keep uh, with a cleanup in the fall and spring? I never, ever let my chickens into my garden. I, even during the fall, they stay in their pen away from my garden. If you have chickens that you can let into your garden in the fall, they will dig everything up. They will eat every bug available in there and uh, they will clean up your garden perfectly. But you got to make sure it's only after the growing season. Some people will say, hey, let a chicken run through your garden. It'll eat all the weeds and bugs. Don't you believe it? I've done it. I've seen it. It will not work. Those chickens will eat anything and everything. If you, if you doubt me, let your chickens loose in your garden. If it works out for you, you have miracle chickens. Keep those chickens. But if you have chickens like mine, they will eat everything that moves, starting with your lettuce. And uh, next one, Dwight. What's the best way to propagate a fig tree? Dwight, I had no idea. I've never grown a fig tree. I don't know. But there's somebody on my Facebook, and I forget the name. It might be Kim. But uh, uh, one of my Facebook friends actually posted pictures and updated on uh, fig tree cuttings. And holy crap, she knew what she was doing. So if you want to come over to my Facebook and join the people there, post your question there. And whoever it was, I'm sure she's uh, watching the post and she can give you better advice than I can. That's the nice thing about having so many gardening friends in one area. If, you, if I don't know the answer or somebody else doesn't know the answer, you have 3,000 plus people who are just waiting to help you out with their information. Whatever they can help you out with, they do it. So no matter what kind of question you have, eventually it gets answered over there. And that's really pretty cool. Okay, another Rose. Rose says, I will be making a vegetable uh, garden for the first time. What can I use in the absence of uh, regular compost uh, for pre-bagged in order to put it into the raised beds? Uh, she gets all kinds of conflicting stuff and she really doesn't know what to do. Let me tell you something, Rose. It is very simple. Yes, it is very simple. I made my raised beds here uh, brand spanking new and I didn't have any kind of anything to put in there. It was too soon for compost, too soon for anything. What I did was I went to the store and I bought bagged topsoil, not potting soil, topsoil. Go to your local uh, Lowe's, um, uh, Home Depot or Menards or even Walmart. Any big store has them really cheap uh, or even garden centers. But garden centers tend to be a little bit more expensive. Look for what's called topsoil. Topsoil is nothing more than dead soil. It's a filler and you can uh, sometimes get it for a buck 25 for a huge 40 pound bag. That's a lot of topsoil. And also get manure. If it says manure on the bag, don't worry if it's composted or not. It is. All bagged manure is composted or rotted manure and it's safe to use right then and there. I would use a, a, a mixture of two parts or three parts bagged top. Oh, let's make it two parts bagged topsoil to one part bagged manure. Put them in there, mix them up with a shovel. You are all set to go for your first year garden. And, and as an added bonus, save a bag or two of manure off to the side. Get a five gallon bucket. Toss a big old heaping handful, or if you don't want to use a handful, half a shovel full into the bucket. Take your water hose, fill it up with water. Let it set overnight and then scoop off the liquid and water your plants. Even in dead soil, compost tea will grow your plants. Yes, compost tea is wonderful and you can use bagged manure to make compost tea. It is absolutely cheap. So for a bag of compost that costs you a couple bucks, you're going to get endless amounts of compost tea or manure tea to water your plants. So that's my advice for you. Two to one on the soil to the manure, use compost tea, you're fine. Gives you a whole season to start making compost or gathering up leaves, grass clippings, whatever you want to do for next season. Okay, next is a friend called Tui, I believe the name is. It's a Vietnamese name and I looked up the pronunciation because I didn't want to uh, uh, insult you by uh, pronouncing your name wrong. So I believe it's called Tui. So Tui asks, I use mushroom compost and chicken manure pellets as compost tea. Is it a good idea to use the mushroom compost? Yes, it is. Absolutely. You're doing perfectly. Keep it up. That, that's my advice. You're doing a good job. Next one from Travis. I get free mulch from my city that has horse poo, grass clippings, leaves, and a bunch of wood chips. I'm assuming you mean compost because that isn't mulch. That's compost. Uh, it's pretty well composted, but it still has chunks of woody stuff in it. Can I use this or should I let the wood uh, decompose? Well, uh, a lot of city compost will use shredded uh, uh, 
uh, mulch, which is shredded bark and stuff like that, in with their compost. And it does break down into a usable amount, even though it has big chunks. Uh, so it's perfectly safe to use. Go ahead and use that, mix it in with your soil. It's perfectly fine. Even though it may be chunks, it is broken down enough to put into your garden. Plus, there's enough nitrogen source in the other stuff, like the grass clippings and other stuff that's in there, the manure, to counterbalance any kind of decom decomposition that the bark has when it borrows nitrogen. So you're perfectly safe. In a nutshell, yes, use it. Ah, last page, folks, last page, and then I can get to uh, doing some plant stuff here. Stephen asks, I wondered about adding too much citrus fruits or garlic to my compost because uh, he heard that citrus is bad, garlic kills uh, bacteria and stuff, so he's wondering, and also about salted uh, foods. Um, let's start with the salted foods. Any kind of salt, no, absolutely no. Bad dog, don't add salted anything to your compost. If it's cooked veggies, I would recommend not. You're asking for my advice. No salt, no cooked veggies. Citrus peels are fine. Some people say citrus peels will uh, kill the worms and stuff or it will acidify your compost. That is absolutely false, actually. The oils and stuff in the citrus, they break down extremely fast in a compost pile. Once they go through the composting process, the citrus peels are not appetizing to worms, but who cares? There's a lot of other stuff in the compost pile that the worms will eat, so don't worry about it. They slowly dissipate, and then the minerals in the, uh, the peels, it may take years, but they slowly leach into the soil, and it is actually good for your soil. So don't worry about that garlic. Don't worry at all. Once it starts decomposing, the bacteria take over. The antibacterial part of the garlic goes away as it decomposes, so you're perfectly safe. But no salt, okay? Okay? No salt. Next one, Kim. Kim asks, oh, by the, by the way, uh, by the way, hi. <laughs> Next one, Kim. Um, I would especially like your thoughts on what would be a good mix for shallow-rooted along with deep-rooted plants. Hmm. That's a tough one, Kim, and I'm going to have to pass that off to the viewers. If anybody has any advice on that, please answer it here in the compost uh, <laughs> Not the compost. The comment section. Yeah, the compost section below, because I really don't know. I don't companion plant uh, at all, and so I really don't know what would be a good combination of deep-rooted and shallow-rooted plants. So uh, if my friends here are viewing and you have any ideas, please post it to Attention Kim and answer her question. Would you... Do me a favor and do that for me. Okay, next one, Heather. Hi, Heather. My question is about when to plant seeds. My beet seeds say to plant as soon as the soil can be worked, but uh, I hear about uh, freezing, hurting them, and all this stuff. Um, as soon as, as the last chance of frost and freezing is over, you can plant your stuff. But, but, if it's a cold weather crop like beets, radishes, carrots, things like that, you can plant them before the last frost. Just make sure you cover them up and uh, don't overwater them because if you're going to have a freeze, you don't need that ice going down there. Just give them a light sprinkling of water to moisten them up. Don't worry at all because cool weather crops like radishes, lettuce, spinach, beets, their seeds can germinate in cold weather or they can stay dormant until it warms up just enough. So you can plant early. And I've done that before myself. I've planted early and I've had frost and they still come up, especially cold crops like cabbage, broccoli. Uh, I've answered this before. They actually do better when it gets colder. For some reason, they taste better too. Okay, next. Uh, only four more questions. Four more. Daniel asks, can you put too much chicken doo-doo in your raised beds? As long as it's composted, um, it's really hard to add too much. You probably could, but I've never found a limit because as long as you dig it in with the natural soil there, uh, it eventually breaks down. It brings up worms. Worms eat it and they break it down and it's a win-win situation. The beds that I had at my old place, they were years and years and years and years old with composted chicken manure and they got better and better and stupid white flies. They got better and better and better each year. So I wouldn't think that there's too much unless, of course, you have a dump truck load and you have one raised bed. You know, <laughs> let's not go nuts. All right, next one. Deborah. Hi, Deborah. Um, how do I keep seedlings from getting too tall and eventually falling over? Uh, should I remove them from the light? And then a couple people, uh, they uh, thumb that uh, question up. That is a big question when it comes to starting your plants indoors. Legginess. And uh, my best uh, answer for that is if you want to pre uh, pro, uh, prevent legginess, feed your seedlings. You can start them in a seed uh, uh, starting mix, but make sure they have food. Don't over fertilize, but make sure that they have a fertile soil. 
Keep them as close to bright light as possible. Dim light is the worst thing for plants. It'll make them leggy and they'll start falling over. And once they're leggy, there really is nothing you can do to make them unleggy because that's just how they are. Uh, they need bright light. And what we're doing is we're starting them indoors just soon enough to where they sprout and get, you know, a little tall, then we get them outside. But if you keep them inside too long, they get leggy and they may or may not recover once you get them outside. So there is no way to take care of them once they are leggy, as far as I know. Yes, you could prop them up, but you know, who wants, you know, a 12 foot tall, you know, radish seedling and then take it out to the garden. It doesn't make any sense. Um, so as far as uh, taking them away from the light, that's just going to hurt it. Give them the most light possible. I know it's difficult to do inside, but if you're starting inside, you got to do the best that you possibly can. And that means get that light closer to the plant. And I keep my seedlings about this high away from the, the light. And I have adjustable lights. I have these socket extenders, which are really cool. And it brings the light closer to the plant. And uh, if anybody's interested in what a socket extender is, just let me know and I'll bring them in on an episode someday. Okay, next one, Elena. Uh, I have a huge pile of straw and chicken manure. I have four nice pallets. How can I use these pallets and tea posts to make a compost bin? Very simple. What you do is you take two of those uh, metal rods, you, you put them into the ground about two feet apart right here and then over there and then over here and then over here. And you, what you're going to do is you're going to put your um, pallets in a square, put the rods in behind them, take a hammer, hammer them into the ground, but don't attach them to the pallets. Lean the pallets against them, fill it up with compost, and the rods will keep the pallets from falling over. And that way, whenever you're, uh, it's time to uh, move your compost, all you gotta do is slide the pallets out, lay them off to the side, turn the compost, put the pallets back in, stack it back up. That's my advice. And uh, there are many different ways to do this, but off the top of my head, that's the best that I can come up with. Using pallets is a good idea too, because they have the sides that will let some of the air in and that's wonderful. And because if you have a closed compost bin, one of the big things is not letting enough air in. So that's actually a good idea. Uh, experiment with it. As long as you can hold it up with those rods, tap them into the ground. You're okay. Last one. Last one is from a friend on Facebook. His name is Richard. Hi, Richard. Uh, Richard says, uh, Ray, does it help to grind or blend eggshells before putting them in the compost pile or garden? That's an extremely good question. Uh, I would recommend blending them or crushing them, but first of all, I would recommend cooking them. Boil them, bake them, microwave them, whatever you have to do to actually cook the eggshells just to be safe. I know some people don't do it and I've been guilty of not doing it, but to play it safe, to keep uh, keep from getting yourself sick, throw them in the microwave for a few seconds, or throw them in boiling water and just boil them for a few minutes to make sure that the you know the ick on the inside is cooked. And also, if you bake them in the oven, that's perfect because it makes them extremely brittle, easy to break up, and you can just grind them up perfectly. And the reason that you want to grind them up or crush them up is because it gives them more surface. The more surface area you have, the faster it can uh, go into the soil and leach into the soil. Same thing with like uh, leaves. If you crush them up, there's more surface area. They break down faster. Same works for uh, eggshells. If you break them up into like a fine powder or into fine pieces, they can be absorbed into the soil and benefit your plants a lot faster. So yes, absolutely, positively. I'm done. Holy crap. Um, <laughs> that was insane. And uh, okay. Uh, now I can relax. <laughs> Thank you everybody for a very, very fun weekend edition on the Voodoo Garden channel. I really do appreciate you joining me here and thanks for sticking around all the way to the end. I know it was a long episode, but I had a lot of questions and I wanted to answer as many questions as I possibly could. If you want to join me and everybody else on Facebook, the link is below. If you want to see a very, very special, and I am talking special, a very special episode on the Praxis 55712 channel. Click on the link below, go to the Praxis 55712 channel, and in a few days, it will be uploaded, probably Monday, I think, I'm hoping on Monday. It is something that is making me smile from ear to ear, and it is fantastic. I'm dying to tell you about it, but I'm going to have to wait and uh, show you on Monday. You're going to love it. And um, I already do love it. So anyway, I got to get going. I'm done yammering away and talking and wasting your time. Thanks, everybody, and have a great day. My name is Ray. I'm out of here.